morning, everyone. Good morning to those who are joining from home, those who are joining from the theater. We're glad that you can be with us. Um, it's we're really we're all one church, and so I'm glad that we're able to worship together um, through the use of technology. So thank you for joining um, Agape Chicago on this Sunday in March. Um, I'm, my name is Dallas. I'll, I'll lead us through the services. First thing we like to do at the beginning is just talk about ways that you can get involved. So we have community groups, we call them agape communities that reach out to um, different, different people groups within our community and they meet on a regular basis. One of those groups is Blue Sky Cathedral led by Steve Johnson. And they are meeting this Wednesday, March 10th at 6.30 on Zoom. So if you want to get involved, um, they reach out to people on the streets. You can talk to Steve, you can email him at stevejohnson34 at hotmail.com. We also have a group, No Returns, that reaches out to refugees in, in, um, in our neighborhood. And I know it says we're meeting this Wednesday. We're actually meeting next Wednesday. We got off schedule. We'll fix it. But if you want any information, um, you can email Laura Bruggers at lnbruggers at gmail.com, or you can talk to me after the service as well. We also have a women's prayer meeting. They meet every Monday evening at 6.30 p.m. on Zoom, and that is led by Molly Hassett. So if you would love to join, um, it, it's a time of prayer for each other, of just talking and catching up and, and studying the scriptures. You can email molly at hassettmb at gmail.com and that email should also be on the screen. By the way, you can rewatch these um, on Facebook um, if you do have Facebook and you wanna go back to find anything. And then finally, we have a group works in progress. So this is a group for artists of all kinds and they are currently having a drama workshop it will be not this Saturday, but next Saturday, March 20th at 10 a.m. outside. And if you would like to get involved um, in works in progress or help out with the drama, you can email Pastor Jeremiah Vaught at jeremiahvaught at gmail.com. Um, in preparation for our um, sermon today, um, we, are we are continuing through the Psalms, Psalms 126. So if you would like to stand, you can feel free to stand um, in reverence to the scripture, God's word, um, or, or continue seated. We should have it on the screen and also in the bulletins if you'd like to follow there. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. Man does not live by bread alone, but man, man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. You may be seated for the preaching of God's word. Let's pray before I begin my sermon today. God, as we come to you today and recognize that it has been one year, one year since our last pre-pandemic service and we've gone through the ups and downs of wondering where we're going to be on a particular Sunday, who we're going to be with, how it's going to go, um, who's going to come. Uh, Father, as we look back at all that we've struggled with on the last year, we also can look back further and remember times that were easier, times that uh, there was so much in life that we took for granted. And today, as our message intentionally looks backward to look forward to help with the now, Father, I pray that we would see the connections that this text makes, and we pray that we would hear from you specifically what you want for each and every single one of us today in this moment. I pray that that would be what you do for us, and I pray that as we open our mouths to gather and reflect on what has been lost to, to uh, and what we've had before, I pray that it would inspire us as we go forward. I pray that you would do that for us in the name of Christ the King. Amen. 
Uh, back in 2014, someone recommended to me a marriage book called Getting the Love You Want by Harville Hendricks. Funny name, I know. And there were some unfamiliar lessons in that book since a number of the different disciplines and beliefs that informed the ideas came from all sorts of places that I'm unaccustomed to. So it was a unique book for me. And one of the foundational ideas of that book uh, was that when we're dating or pursuing someone to marry, um, on a subconscious level, we are evaluating people in light of our opposite sex parents. So if you're a boy, you're evaluating women in light of your mom. If you're a, a woman, you're inviting, you're, you're evaluating men in light, of, uh, in light of your father. And so that sounds a little gross to us. I know we've heard that idea before. It's a little strange. Um, but what this author said that we're doing on a subconscious level is we're saying uh, about our what we grew up with, that there was something about what we grew up with that we like and something that we want to change. And so we're hoping for some similarity and some dissimilarity. Now, the insight in that idea doesn't come from the fact that it's possible you might have someone that you marry one day that's going to be like and unlike your opposite sex parent. That's pretty obvious, right? The insight comes from the fact that we're doing that without even knowing about it, that we're, we, we want that somehow and it's ingrained in us and we haven't even quite articulated it yet, but it's there, it's present. It's part of what we're doing, even if we're not cognizant of that fact. And so I, I find that compelling because I find that true to the rest of my life. You see, I believe that you, like me, are hardwired to let positive past experiences shape our hopes for the future, which drives our actions right now. Past joys form future longings, which guide our steps today. Now, today's psalm reflects this reality, not just on an individual level, but also on a corporate level, on a larger level for an entire nation who has experienced God's great power in the past and are striving in hope to see God's promises for the future realized. Today's psalm offers, in poetic fashion, a universal principle, and uh, sometimes it's dangerous to uh, impose a universal principle on songs because they don't work quite in that sort of rational fashion, but in fact, we can derive a universal principle from Psalm 126, and it's true for God's people of all times, and it goes like this, delighting in God's past kindness shapes our future hopes which empowers joy even in present pain. Delighting in God's past kindness shapes our future hopes, which empowers joy even in present pain. Now, Psalm 126 is being sung by people that need hope for their future to labor on. Something's going on that we don't quite know what is happening exactly, that they need some help to drive them forward. And so what we'll see that they do is that they remember to hope for what lies ahead. And my sermon will help you see all this as it gives you three directions, really. I'm going to offer you three directions, which paints a picture of how this works. First, I'm going to call us to reflect with the light on God's past gift. Reflect with the light on God's past gifts. Build your future vision upon past grace. And then the third direction is cling to vision to overflow with joy. So let's start with the first one. Reflect with the light on God's past gift. Reflect with the light on God's past gifts. To help you get more of the layout of Psalm 126, let me just put it to you this way. Psalm 126 verses 1 through the first part of 3 are talking about past events, something that's happened before. The end of verse 3 is about the present, and verses 4 through 6 are about hopes for the future, are relaying a hope for the future. And so when we see that and how it's laid out, we're able automatically to start making sense of how this psalm applies to our life. First, let's look at the past in verses 1-2. If you'll read that with me again. It said, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nation, the Lord has done great things for them. Now, if you've ever been on the receiving end of incredible gifts, of incredible generosity, you perhaps have felt something like what verse 1 talks about. 
you you feel something has happened in your life that is so wonderful. You, you kind of want to pinch yourself and ask, am I dreaming here? Uh, like receiving a gift that you didn't think a loved one could afford. Or like having a surprise party thrown in your honor and seeing loved ones that you haven't seen for years that you didn't imagine could possibly be in front of you. You see, grief has a denial stage. But joy sometimes also does too that we feel in our body. If you've ever gone through that experience before where something's happening that you just can't believe. That's so good that you can hardly believe your eyes that you're wondering, why has this happened to me? And that's what's going on for Israel. They're like, we were those who dreamed. That was a great experience for them. And we don't know exactly wh what the occasion was for this joy. Most believe it's about the return of the exiles from Babylon in the 5th century B.C., now, it doesn't matter the occasion, however, for there were many times when God was working in the people of Israel when his grace would have seemed too good to be true. The deliverance of a small nation out of Egypt through plague and parted sea, for example, would have been an occasion to say, wow, are we dreaming? Or how about the gifting of a land of blessing against insurmountable odds and undefeatable foes? Wow, are we dreaming? Or even the time where God gave and poured in so many riches into Jerusalem to build Solomon's temple. Wow, are we dreaming? We're like those who were dreaming. We could see, see how that would apply to all those situations where time and time again, God's work was so magnificent in their midst that to pause and to reflect would cause a wonderful shock to the system. And of course, such a surprise leads to the writing of songs like we're reading today. Uh, we are reading a collection of songs which reflects the fact that there must have been a joy that caused such singing. Now I imagine, or I hope a number of you have had a taste of experiences like this in your individual life, or perhaps even as a part of your church family in the past. Perhaps you have received genuine forgiveness from someone you have wounded but loved deeply. Maybe you can recall times in worship where the love of God was so obvious to you that it seemed like the only thing that mattered in the world. Perhaps you can recall a time where you and a bunch of friends were praying for someone else who had cancer, and the doctors had no hope that it would be cured, but this person somehow miraculously went into recession. You perhaps have experienced something like this, where God's kindness, his mercy was too wonderful for words. And even if you have experienced those things, and certainly if you haven't, what I want to tell you is, is that all those great experiences are a dim reflection of the greatest gift of all. For God in sending his son to live with us, to suffer in our place, and beat the enemy that no one can, gives us a gift that makes us have more reason to sing than those that talk about Zion's, uh, Zion's restoration. It's like a dream, too good to be true, what we believe. Now, over the course of your Christian life, you have probably not felt so enamored by that gift. You've maybe not experienced regular delight and appreciation of Christ and his wonderful service to you. But if we receive a wonderful gift for our birthday and we're kind of eh about it, we don't really appreciate it like we ought, we certainly know that that says nothing about the gift and everything about us. And so that's why we come and we gather week in and week out and we celebrate the gift. We, we clap and we praise our God because of that gift, because we need to remember how wonderful it is and because there's something wrong with us that we don't value it so much. We come here and we do what we do in a week in and week out fashion so that we may recall the blessings that we have. And what I want to tell you is that Often enough, when we reflect on our past, and even in moments where God uh, makes his beauty and grace known to us, we are in a position to join uh, the writers of Psalm 126.2 as they talk about breaking out in song and in joy and clapping. Um, in fact, I, I want to say that many of us ought to have experienced at times, uh, whether it's in private or in public, uh, something like what Mark Twain describes, and you, which you've heard before, and I think it honestly reflects Psalm 126.2. It says this, 
Sing like no one is listening. Love like you have never been hurt. Dance like no one is watching. And live like heaven has met earth. For in fact, for us, we know that heaven, the darling of heaven, has come to earth. And we are like those who have dreamed. And so we have all the occasion to dance like no one's watching, to sing like no one's listening, and at times love like we've never been hurt. Like this psalm, we are a people that can reflect on God's goodness because if we see it for what it is, it fills our heart with gladness. So I, I could end with this. I could call us not simply to reflect with gladness, but what I want to suggest to you is that when we reflect on our past, if we see it appropriately, it certainly will fill us with gladness. And that's not all. That helps us as we look forward, as we look to what lies ahead. So I lead you, uh, I want to call you with a second direction to build your future upon past grace, to build your future on past grace. Now, Psalm 126 is kind of an odd song, if you think about it. It starts with a happy beginning and ends with a little bit of a conflict, a, a, a difficulty. We're not used to stories or even songs working out that way. Songs start with a problem, and then it gets resolved over the course of time. And Psalm 126 is kind of reversed in that regard. It starts with what we might call the resolution, and then it ends with the tension. So read with me about this tension in verse 4. It says this, Restore our fortunes, Lord, like streams in the Negev. Again, we don't know the, the, the occasion for the calls for restoration of fortunes. But again, we don't need to. It is enough to know, uh, it is enough to know that they are comparing their current situation to being in a desert. And we've been there before, haven't we? For that is what the Negev is. It's a massive desert, in case you were wondering. We aren't sand people, but we certainly know what it's like to be in dry places. And we've never ridden camels, but we know what it's like to be on hard soil in tough times. But we also know something else that's, that's strange about this passage. It talks about streams flowing in the Negev. And we're not, again, uh, people that ride camels or sand people, but we watch movies. And we know that streams don't flow in deserts. So what in the world is being envisioned here? Well, the good news is we're, we're taught that we should learn something new each day. And I'm getting ready to teach you something new today, okay? So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about this desert. The Negev has an incredibly hot and dry season where, of course, no water is to be found. And if you were to go to the Negev during its dry season, you would see no water. But you would see something that shows and reflects that at some point there was water along here. There would be indentions in the sand. And during the rainy season, those indentions fill with water that's flowing out. And all of a sudden, even flowers grow called crocuses in that place, making it a dramatic presentation where flowers are even growing in the desert. You see, this singer recognizes that present dryness doesn't mean that it's always going to stay that way. There is a possibility of restoration and beauty even in the midst of the desert. There is a surprise that comes in the cycles of nature. You've got your Chicago winter, but then you've got your summer, folks, and the summer is coming. There's a hope for that. You see, there is a cycle even in our lives where even as believers, we go through uh, periods of dryness and periods of plenty. And when you're going through the cycle of plenty, it's the past, it's the memory of the flowers in the desert that drives us forward. Uh, there was a song in the 80s called Big Country by a band called Big Country. I know it's not very creative. But the lyrics to the song at one point says, I am not asking to grow flowers in the desert. But what this passage is actually doing is that very thing. They are asking for God to grow flowers in the desert. They're asking God to do what God alone does. You can grow crocuses in the middle of dry and arid places, God. When someone trusts God like this, it allows them to sing lyrics like we see that follow it. That's the most famous part of our passage today. It says this in Psalm 126, 5 through 6. It says, those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves 
with them. Now, I had a hard time this week uh, with these verses because I wanted to make sure I understood exactly what this imagery conveyed. Um, I have a hard time when I look at this passage and I recognize certainly this is a metaphor. Those that are going out planting with tears in their eyes will reap with joy someday. It certainly isn't simply about people that garden. It must be something bigger than just that. But the imagery certainly also is of dirt and soil and rain and water and food and life. It's, it's the stuff of everyday experience. And I wanted to make sure I recognized that, yes, this is a metaphor, but I didn't want to make it merely metaphorical. So I started asking some questions like, God, why, why are people sowing seeds with tears in their eyes? I mean, after all, many of us know um, that planting is a very fun thing. I, you know, most people, many people like to guard it. It's a hobby for a lot of folks. What in the world is going on that's causing these people to, to cry? Um, in fact, uh, I would say that over the last two summers, one of my great hobbies has been to grow a little garden in my back garden. I've enjoyed it greatly. And last summer, it might have been one of the things that kept me sane to the extent I was sane. So I'm wondering what in the world is going on? Why are they crying while they're planting seed? Now, first of all, um, to answer my, my question, we all know the difference in the pressure when the results of your work don't really affect your livelihood so much. We all know the difference between a job and a hobby. Uh, for me, though, I might be slightly annoyed if my Thai chili pepper plant doesn't give me the peppers I desired or my basil plant doesn't actually have any leaves, uh, it's not going to make sure that I don't eat, okay? And in Psalm 126, what we're seeing are a bunch of people that are sowing in a, in a hard situation, as we'll see in a second, and their livelihoods depend upon it. Consider today that since the 50s, farmers have an incredibly high rate of suicide. Perhaps you knew that, perhaps you didn't. Uh, factory farms have caused smaller farmers to have a, time, have a hard time with things these days. And so one can even understand in our modern time how desperate of a situation farming is, how much more so in that time when your livelihood absolutely depended on it. There was no grocery store. Uh, if there was a famine in the land, you died. <laughs> There's a reason people are sowing in tears. And again, remember, this sowing is connected to the image of the Negev, the desert, planting, sowing, working, doing all this hard labor and possibly realizing that these seeds I'm putting into the ground will never grow because there's not enough water in the soil. You see, what you need to imagine in this picture are a bunch of farmers together going out and scattering seeds into the ground that's perhaps too dry because the rain hasn't come and being terribly afraid because there hasn't been a cloud in the sky for weeks. And they don't know how in the world anything is going to come of this situation. And they're going out sowing because they know they have to, but they're doing so with tears. And why do they sow? Well, you say if they don't sow, they for sure will not eat. That is true, of course. But even more importantly, they sow because they've seen what God does with seeds over and over and over again, and they trust him. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm taking now the literal truth and applying it to the metaphor, do you see? Do you see that there are times where we have to go about the business of doing God's work, even when we see no possibility of success? Um, do I need to connect the dots, dear friends, to our post-pandemic, post-Christian world? where we just don't know what's going on with people. You know, there are, there are people that speculate how many people are going to leave the church after this is all said and done. When things return to normal, how many people will come back? And we're wondering, is all this stuff we're doing Sunday in and Sunday out and all the people we're trying to connect with, does it really matter? And what I want us to do is I want us to be a people that sow even with tears, expecting to reap with joy because God does surprising things and he loves to meet needs right at the time we need it. You see, the story of Israel and the early apostles is our story. It's not just their story. It belongs to us as well. And the past shapes our future vision. The flowers in the desert before shape what we believe can come again. Vision comes first and foremost by considering God's past grace before anything else, before anything else. 
You, you see, vision doesn't come from the minds of leaders. It comes from the story of God. And then that shapes what leaders say. You see, let me say something about that word vision that I'm using here. For some of you, it either inspires a great deal of excitement or it frightens you a little bit. For how many leaders, not least preachers, get up and talk about their visions, and then when a little bit of it's met with resistance, it's dropped by the wayside. The visions that someone uh, made and made promises of, they don't come to fruition. But God, when he promises things, I want to tell you that shapes our vision, and it's always don't say all, uh, yes, always, always going to be the sort of thing that we've seen him do in the past, sometimes greater, sometimes differently, but it's going to be like what he's done before because God loves to surprise us with flowers in the desert. He loves to do things that we cannot do ourselves. You see, our vision for the future, yes, it needs to be shaped by the time and the circumstance, but it always must be grounded and what God has done in the past. And certainly that's true for us as Christians. We recognize that uh, the best thing that's happened to us and ever will happen to us shows us that we have all the reason to hope in the future. Consider how Romans 8.32 puts it. It says this, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Do you catch that? God gave us Christ. What does that mean about our future? It means that if there's any good thing, we will get that too, that God wants for us in addition to Christ. How much are we letting the past and what Christ has done for us and in us shape our hopes for the future? Why, Dear friends, not only does God bring flowers from the desert, he brings life from death. And that's what the message of Christianity is all about. That's what we believe and hold fast to. And that's what shapes our vision first and foremost. God's past work and his future promises in light of Christ shape our visions for the future. And we are, when we are grounded in both God's past and life and future promises, that shapes the time that matters most to God, which is right now, today. So the last, the, the last call, the last direction I'm going to give you is... Number three, cling to godly vision to overflow with joy right now. Cling to godly vision to overflow with joy right now. The center of Psalm 126 is the back part of verse three. After saying that the nations recognize that God has done great things for Israel, the people respond, the, the writer responds, yes, God has done great things for us. And then the only time it happens in this psalm, it speaks in the present tense at the end of verse 3, and it says this, and we are filled with joy. Filled with joy. I want you to think about that word, filled with joy. Filled is a very interesting word, and I, I say it like a Southern Appalachian person, so it may sound like filled, but I actually mean filled. So don't worry about that. And as you think about a a cup or a bowl that's full of water. Think about how difficult it is to carry it from one place to the next. The slightest trip, the slightest nudge, the slightest anything is going to cause all that water to spill out of a bowl or a cup. And the person speaking of themselves in their current moment, even in their desert, they're speaking of themselves as filled with joy, looking forward to what's ahead. That's, a, that's an amazing thought, isn't it? They're describing themselves as being in such a position in life that, yes, they're struggling, but if you knock them a little bit, joy is going to spill out. If, if they're walking down the street, a little joy is going to spill out. And guess what? If the sufferings of life hit them as hard as possible, it's just going to come flowing out all over the place. Joy is present in the person that sees God's past work, connects that to the vision of the future, and helps them have joy right now, even in present pain, like I talked about. You see, as we get to the end of our COVID-19 tunnel, we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. It's growing larger and larger each and every single week uh, as we see that vaccines are going, going into more arms and faster and the number of coronavirus cases are going down. I don't want us to get to the end of this thing and be like, back to normal without reflecting on why perhaps we haven't had as much joy as we should have in this current time. You see, joy didn't have to go away for these last, this last year, folks. And if it has, it shows that there's something about this song that we need to learn from, right? Uh, if, if we were in a situation where someone knocked you 
joy wouldn't pour out, but just anger and antagonism, you know, which is, you know, I think most of, at least I'm, I'm, I'm imposing on you. I haven't even got to hang out with you guys. So maybe it's just me, but I imagine because it's what I'm going through that you go through as well. And because of that, what I, I really want us to do today as I end the service, I, I wanted to say, you know what? It's really easy to get up here and preach a sermon. I've got to think, I've got to reflect, I've got to look at hard parts of my life, but I want you to do the same thing. I want you to do the same thing. And what I uh, assigned to the church this week was a question because I want to make sure that you understand, we all understand that to strive for what's going to lie ahead, we need to consider what we miss most. You see, I think some of us have been able to reflect on what we miss most from before. And what that's going to do is it's going to change how we relate to people in the future. We're going to say, we're going to treasure that a little bit more. We're going to celebrate that a little bit more. That's going to be something we value and emphasize a little bit more. And so to that end, I've asked you to consider and now answer out loud. And I'm going to come uh, bring around the microphone for anybody that wants to answer this question out loud. I wanted to ask you, what experiences with your church and fellow believers have been the hardest for you to do without this year? What's been the hardest thing for you to do without this year, especially as it relates to believers and fellow Christians? And I've got one response here from someone that I sent in an answer, um, but I want to also give an opportunity for those that are here as well. And I'll come around to you. I'm going to get away from you and uh, let you answer it with the uh, microphone. So just uh, raise your hand, stand up, and I'll come. What's been the hardest thing for you to do without this year as it relates to your church and your fellow believers? Steve McCall, the phone. Yeah, the hardest thing is not to be in uh, meeting with you guys on Sundays. So just seeing your faces and having conversations um, brings me an incredible amount of light. And so, especially for those winter months when we couldn't meet. That was that took a big toll on me spiritually. Read. I would say that uh, the Sunday mornings when we're milling around afterward, after uh, service, uh, I didn't realize how thick those thin threads of connection are when you just say hello to someone and talk about their week, even for that brief moment. And it's been missed. And, and now I realize just how much that was encouraging to me, even though it was just a flit here to one person, to another person, uh, there's an incredible sense of disconnect uh, that I, I'm feeling from the family because I just don't have those little moments. Uh, the other thing is I also miss meeting with our agape community in person. Um, there's nothing like coming together and uh, having a meal, iron sharpening iron, studying the word, praying, and really driving a little bit deeper in relationship than those Sunday flits do. Uh, and you just don't get all of it that you want to get on Zoom. And so I look forward to uh, whatever the new normal is, uh, appreciating those Sunday mornings and those chance or small or quick encounters, and also getting back to agape community in person. Coming over to Molly Hassett um, right now. Good morning. I miss I miss um, a couple of things. It, of course, what Pastor Steve has said and. Just being able to minister to one another and encourage one another but there's a few things that i thought of was um i love i miss really listening to everyone singing mm -hmm. um, and it's such a such a gift when we're in church mm -hmm. and i i just want one aspect of our service that i really love and the second is being able to uh come together for communion and kind of a, a very holy moment and just an example of our faith and devotion to the lord and so those are the two things in addition to just just being with all of our people uh, that I that I miss the most. Lord and calendar. Um, I think I miss most serving with the children. Um, 
getting to have a whole group of kids run out of service once worship is over and getting to be responsible <laughs> to try to corral them in and get through a bible lesson and you know have five snack breaks but i missed that you know and it was it was a lot of fun and like i liked having new kids come in and like you know meeting these new kids and just getting to be a big kid for an hour out of my busy school week you know something i really looked forward to that i miss now you know so like Steve said, I'm also excited to embrace the new normal, whatever it may look like. Sarah Scazzaro. Um, I really miss the Living Well community group where we were ministering to the people at the Waterford Nursing Home. Um, that was a beautiful time of um, really bonding with the residents, we became friends. And um, with all the people from Agape who we were with, it was a beautiful time. So I really look forward to whatever God has for the future with that, um, with the nursing home building up or whatever God has. Our community group, um, we meet on Zoom, but whenever we got together in person, we would always end up eating. Like, it's just a thing, right? You're always hungry, or at least one person in your group is hungry. So I miss, um, even if it was just like a frozen pizza or just throwing something together really quick, just getting food together and eating, it just made it feel like a really uh, close-knit community when you have something like that together. Uh, not the same over Zoom. It's also, I also miss um, being able to tutor uh, folks in English in person. It's really difficult over Zoom. So um, definitely miss getting to know some some families in person and meeting together. Thank you, Pastor. So yes, Jordan asked me to answer my question. Oh, I'll take a picture asking that. In this out. So yeah, I'm gonna answer that question um, this way. Um, Molly took my communion answer. I, I also put that out there, but that's one thing. You know, in general, so we, we've talked a little bit about food. I miss watching people pour coffee and drinking coffee. I do miss seeing children run around. Believe it or not, I enjoyed, uh, it, it's kind of a, a love-hate, but I, I miss some of the times of setup together with people because I get a chance to talk with folks. And I, you know, we talk often about, hey, wouldn't it be nice not to have to set up? But there are times when I can look back and say, hey, that was really quite nice. Um, I, I miss seeing more faces. There are people here that I, I miss seeing. Uh, there are lots of things that I could say. And there, uh, I, I also, I, I'm looking forward to having children back like Jordan. I'm looking forward to having the Agape communities uh, meet again. There's much that I could say, but let, but let me close it out this way. Um, there are going to be times in the future again where some of those things that we just talked about aren't going to seem as valuable as they do to you right now. And what I'm what I'm really after today's message is saying, remember that. And remember that perhaps if it's important to you, it might be important to lots of other people and you just don't know it. And see, you're not the only one. We're not the only ones that take for granted a number of things. It's true for so many folks. And it's often the things that we all take for granted, as they say, the small things in life that make the big difference. And so a, a big part of that reflection that I'm talking about in the past is meant to drive us forward. And if, if you're listening today and you're thinking, you know, there's not a lot, uh, especially as it related to the church or, or my Christian uh, believers that I missed, I, I, wanna, I wanna say that that's not how it ought to be. And whether the reason is, is because we need to be a healthier community, whether there's something in the gift itself that you're not appreciating, that's for us to work it out, to evaluate. But there, there are things that are, are good in what God calls us to. We cause the church to gather, to gather. There's a reason for that. He knows way more about ourselves than we do. Uh, I like what Steve said. I mean, that, that sounds so superficial, what he's talking about at one level. Oh, you know, the people just chat afterwards. But no, it's a really, really big deal. And God knows that. God knows that, that we need that kind of thing. Uh, speaking of which, there was an article uh, that said something very similar to what Steve said and corroborated the importance of what they call uh, small connections or loose connections and casual connections to our overall well-being. And I'm going to put that on Facebook this week since he said that. But I want us to understand there's so much that we probably don't even realize that we've missed. And 
when we look forward, I want us to be able to slow down, reflect, and pay attention to God's past work, again, to drive us forward and hope for, uh, for that now. Even today, yeah, we're having to wait longer than we wanted to for a vaccine or waiting longer than we have to for these masks to come off or go outside or, or whatever. But as you're waiting, reflect with joy on the reason you're striving right now. Those who go out sowing with tears will reap with song of joy, dear friends. Let's pray. And then Steve is going to come up and lead us in song after, yeah. He's going to come through. So, Father, thank you so much for this church and the opportunity that we have to think about growing flowers in the desert, of, of reaping songs of joy uh, when we sow, even in tears and difficulty and pain. We need this song right now. We need to regather around it. And so I pray that our hearts would be helped in this moment to trust you and that uh, we would we would know that there are so many things you've done for us in the past and we can believe that uh, a taste of that is coming again. And we're, as we wait for that, we're patient right now in our current desert situation. We pray these things in the name of Christ the King. Amen. Amen. By the way, uh, Sarah uh, has a, a basket if you wanted to offer, making an offering, if you can raise your hand or grab her uh, to, to, um, to give her give you the basket and she will pass it to you. Uh, but for right now, Stephen is going to lead us in song in response. If you have your bolts, you're going to take that out. The words are in there. These two songs that we're going to sing are um, have more of a lament tone, dealing with um, pain, longing for uh, heaven and um, suffering. And then we'll end with a slight uh, song of hope as we sing Hallelujah. So let's sing together. If you'll stand with me.
Um, you can be seated just as we do a few announcements. So um, just wanted to reiterate that we do have community groups that are continuing to meet. Um, and although that we all miss some things and there are some challenges, we do um, still still love to be able to meet together and to continue ministering. So Blue Sky Cathedral, 6.30 this Wednesday on Zoom. Um, you can contact Steve Johnson. Um, no Returns um, is actually going to be next Wednesday. Um, women's Prayer Meeting is every Monday night. So tomorrow, Monday evening at 6.30 um, on Zoom. And Molly Hassett um, leads the Women's Prayer Meeting. And then Works in Progress, um, not this Saturday, but next Saturday at 10 a.m. is the drama workshop. And so you can contact Pastor um, Jeremiah Vought if you have any questions about that. Um, for today's charge and blessing, um, just wanted to reiterate the fact that, um, as Pastor uh, Jeremiah was saying, that there, God brings us this joy um, that really just is a joy that comes from, from nowhere else. And um, even in these challenging times, um, I just want to pray that we might all um, remember the joy that, that only God can provide. And remember, it, even as we do go back to normal and, and things that, that we never forget um, the blessings that God gives us, even during the hard times and the fact that he's always there with us. And um, so Philippians 4, 7, may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. May we all remember that peace and that joy that comes from above, no matter what our circumstances are. So may you go in peace, uh, be the church this week, and I will See you all later. Have a blessed Sunday. Yeah. Have a great Sunday.